All right, we're going to do a study today of Mark chapter 13. Uh, this is one of the parallel passages to Matthew chapter 24, and uh, we are commanded in Scripture to study to show thyself approved unto God, the workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Uh, we're to compare Scripture with Scripture. And uh, when you do, you'll see that uh, this time period that's coming is clearly for the Jews, the nation of Israel. You can get that from Matthew chapter 24, but really a lot of scriptures tie in when you look at Mark chapter 13. So we're going to look at Mark chapter 13, then I'm going to do two other studies, one on Luke 17 and one on Luke 21, because those are also more passages about this coming time of Jacob's trouble and the second coming. Uh, the rapture is not mentioned. The rapture of the body of Christ is not mentioned in either of or in any of those passages. Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. All those things, all those four different uh, chapters there, they all occur before the crucifixion. Jesus is not speaking to Christians. You see, he's speaking to Jews under the law. Read Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 uh, through 17, I believe it is. Let me just check there real quickly. I'll read this for you. Hebrews chapter 9, yeah, verse 15 through 17. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For, as a, for a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. The New Testament does not begin in Matthew chapter 1, as I've said in many studies. If you're new to this, uh, you've probably not heard this before. A lot of the Baptists will not talk about this. Baptists and things like this, I'm saying. I call them Baptists because Baptists are, modern ones are basically Catholic. But uh, the New Testament begins with the death of the testator. So that's your opinion. No, I just read it in Hebrews chapter 9. You need to deal with the scriptures. Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21 are all before Jesus dies. So they're in the Old Testament, doctrinally speaking. He's not talking to Christians. But let's begin. Mark chapter 13. Get a King James Bible. Don't just sit there and watch this thing and just kind of nod your head and oh, I think he's telling me the truth. Get a King James Bible and turn in it and make sure that I'm telling you the truth. Mark chapter 13, verse 1. And as he went out of the temple, one of his disciples saith unto him, Master, see what manner of stones and what buildings are here. One of his disciples. You say, wait a second, how does that compare to Matthew chapter 24? Well, you can turn over to Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. It says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his, his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Uh-oh, we have a contradiction. It says here in Matthew 24, verse 1, his disciples, Mark 13, it says, one of his disciples. But look at the wording very closely. Matthew chapter 24, his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. Mark 13, verse 1, one of his disciples saith unto him. Okay, that's why it's so important to compare scripture with scripture. Matthew chapter 24, the disciples come to him and say, and they're going to show him the buildings of the temple. But one of them speaks. And I believe that that was Judas Iscariot, the one that betrayed him, the disciple that betrayed him. Because he was the one that kept the bag and things. He would have been the one impressed by money. Just a theory. Okay? But let's continue. Mark chapter 13, verse 2. And Jesus answering said unto him, Seest thou these great buildings? There, there shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. All right? Jesus gives a prophecy of what happens in 70 AD. Jesus is not saying that all the events that I'm going to describe from here on out and, you know, Revelation and everything else, which hasn't even been written yet, you know, that that's all going to happen by 70 AD. That's called the preterist position. All right. These people are ridiculous. They say that everything, all the end time stuff, the Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast, the one world government, it all happened in the first century before 70 AD. Uh, they're crazy. They have to spiritualize all sorts of things. Uh, no, it did not happen before 70 AD. What happened in 70 AD is the destruction of the temple. How do you know? Continue reading. Mark chapter 13, verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately. So they're not saying, you know, 
it's it's not it's it's not that uh, Jesus. There's no pause there between him saying temple is going to be destroyed. Oh, and all these things are going to happen too. No, there's a pause there. He says these this building is going to be thrown down. All the stones are going to be torn down and everything else. It's going to be destroyed. Then he walks away, and his disciples come. They're thinking he's talking about the end of the world. See, let's see about that. Verse four. Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? If you read over in Matthew chapter 24, if you want to just hop back there, verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Matthew here is giving his account of what he heard, what he remembered. Mark is giving his account here. All right. So what's going on there is they're saying is, you know, Jesus says it's going to be the destruction of the temple and they're going, oh, you mean at the end of the world? You know, no, Jesus didn't mean at the end of the world. He meant the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. But since they just came and said, what are the signs of thy coming and of the end of the world there? Basically, Jesus is saying, OK, I'm going to tell you about that stuff now. I already told you that the temple is going to be destroyed. And that thing happened, you know, 40 years later, essentially, approximately 40 years later. But you asked me about the end of the world and of the second coming, so I'm going to tell you about that. Mark chapter 13, verse 5. And Jesus answering them began to say, Take heed lest any man deceive you. Is there much deception out there today? It is astounding the levels of deception that are out there. I mean, I've been saved now for quite a few years, going on 20 years now, uh, professing Christian a lot longer than that, but genuinely saved uh, since the time I was 25. I'm 42 now. So uh, we're heading towards uh, 20 years of salvation, and I've been in active ministry now for 10 years, full-time ministry, and I am still stunned by the fact of how much I've been deceived in my life. There's still things the Lord shows me even to this very day, and I, and I say, I can't believe I was doing that and I was I was following this. I believed that or whatever else. There, the, the, the deception, there's deception and then multiple layers of that deception. I mean, it just, it's insanity. Jesus Christ accurately prophesied the future. I heard a Jewish rabbi the one time, Rabbi Mordecai Kraft, and he said, Jesus only ever gave one prophecy and it failed. <laughs> like a, uh, got a little bit of a bias there against Jesus being your Messiah. So you just lie about him. Uh, no, Jesus gave many prophecies and they're all coming to pass. Okay. Deception is at a level right now. You know, they talk about fake news and all this. I mean, there's so much deception. Everybody knows that. Jesus's words have come true. But let's continue. Verse 6, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Give me a minute here. Some of the new versions have actually changed the thing of uh, this warning here of many coming in my name, saying, I am Christ, and deceiving many. They have actually changed it in the new versions. They'll say, instead of Christ, the Greek word Christos, they'll say, it's Messiah. They say, well, see, because Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Messiah, so we can just interchange it. No, you can't, because the Greek text does not use the word. There is actually a place where it actually, I forget the exact verse, but it talks about, you know, which is being interpreted Messiah, you know. So the, the word Messiah is in the New Testament. So you don't have free reign to just change, to just willy-nilly say, oh, we'll just say Christ here and Messiah over there. They did it uh, to cover up for a very important thing here, which I will show you. Here we have the New St. Joseph Baltimore Catechism. There you go. Look at that picture. Priest on earth, another Christ. The ordained priest takes the place of Christ. Excuse me, I was thinking of another one of the pictures in here. There you go. You know? See if I can find this other one. There's, there's, it's all through here, all through the catechism, official, official Catholic. This is the one I was thinking of. Christ, our high priest in heaven, the priest on earth, another Christ. Right there, you're seeing it. And in case some papist out there is saying, we don't believe that, we don't believe it, we don't believe it. 
Nihil obstat, imprimi potest, nihil obstat imprimatur. Car Francis Cardinal Spellman is the one there at the bottom, imprimatur. Official Catholic teaching. So you can't duck this thing and say, oh, we don't believe that way. Yes, you do. And I've had Catholics try to deny the Baltimore Catechism. They try to say, well, we don't actually teach that. Um, yes, they do. And I can show a lot of the other catechisms and stuff like that. But you also have in, among the Charismatics, you have the thing of them saying, we are anointed. Anointed one of God is Christ. So you have the Charismatics saying, we are anointed and all this other stuff. We're anointed. I'm an anointed and blah, blah, blah. You're saying that you're Christ. It's a warning about the end times. And it doesn't say... Some shall come in my name. It says, many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Are the Catholic priests deceiving people? Oh, yeah. It is sad to see Catholics in there and the way that they try to, you know, show that they're right in things like this. They'll say, uh, you know, Jesus didn't give us a Bible. He gave us a church. Uh, I've given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, you know. One just one scripture comes to mind. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You know, <laughs> I will build my church upon this rock. He's talking about himself. How do you know? Because Peter, who he's discussing things with there, a few verses later, he calls him Satan. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me. You know, and just on and on and on. What's going on there? A bunch of priests taking the title of Christ have deceived many. Verse 7, Mark chapter 13, verse 7. And when ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, be ye not troubled, for such things must needs be, but the end shall not be yet. Are we hearing of wars and rumors of wars right now? Absolutely. Yeah. And war has become something that global interests make a lot of money off of it. Different... Uh, arms dealers and things like that, uh, you know, Lockheed Martin and, uh, well, I mean, you can go on and you could just, all the different things, the pharmaceutical industry, all these different things, they make lots and lots and lots of money off of war. War has become business. You know, back in the 1800s, you had in, you know, the Civil War here in America, you had the generals on the battlefield out there with the, the troops. Uh, that doesn't happen anymore. They come, they might just do a little show and just kind of shake some hands and things like that and give a nice little speech and whatever else. But for the most part, the high command, they're, these guys are highly educated. They're making money off the war themselves many times through their investments and whatever else. War is a sham today. Unless you're a foot soldier, then, well, you're out there getting killed. But uh, you study the Bible prophecy, there is nuclear war coming and world war. There will be a World War III. I don't know... You know, there's a lot of stuff that's going to happen here in the not-too-distant future. Is there going to be World War III before the rapture? I don't know. How much is the body of Christ going to have to see? I don't know. But certainly you see wars in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 8. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in divers places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Okay, so... I think that we are either entering into or in that beginnings of sorrows time period. All right. And I think a big part of the big the the sorrow, I'll say, these beginnings of sorrows is going to be when the rapture happens, I believe and I'm not, I'm not going to be super dogmatic about it, but I believe that the children under the age of accountability, we'll say 10 years and younger, are going to be leaving at the rapture. You can debate it back and forth. You can say, well, yeah, but only if, you know, if they have one saved parent, then the, the children are clean, according to 1 Corinthians 7. Um, so I think that or whatever, but, I'll, you know, you can debate it back and forth. I'm not going to part company with brethren over whether or not you think babies are going up. But uh, I think that there's some pretty good arguments for that happening. Um, would that lead to sorrow? You know, uh, yeah, I think it would. It would lead to some very, very distraught women that have lost their children, you know, at the rapture. Before the Lord pours out his right, righteous fury and judgment, he might just say, okay, children, come on up. 
I don't know. Verse 9, But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Kind of like Paul, the Apostle Paul, what happened with him in the book of Acts, going before King Agrippa and ultimately Caesar and all that other stuff. Yeah. But uh, notice why it's important to compare Scripture with Scripture. You read over in Matthew chapter 24, there's nothing in there about having to you know, go basically here, be, was it say the exact wording, in the synagogues ye shall be beaten. It's not in Matthew chapter 24. Um, why is that important? Because Christians don't get to go into synagogues. Remember why the Jews got so mad at Paul in the book of Acts? This man, you know, has brought Gentiles into the temple. They consider that to be an unclean thing. Hmm. So who would be brought, brought into the synagogues to be beaten? That would be Jews. Who's Jesus speaking to here? His Jewish disciples. That'll be important later. Verse 10. And the gospel must be first must first be published among all nations. Okay? And you say, well, see, that's the, that's the Great Commission. That's the Great Commission. Well, again, let's compare Scripture with Scripture. Matthew chapter 24 Verse 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. They're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Show me anywhere at all in the Pauline epistles where a Christian is told to preach the gospel of the kingdom. You know, the kingdom of God is there because it's spiritual fellowship between us and the Lord, but we're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. We're not preaching that. And again, these posties, they are not able to even read plain English. They'll say oh, it's the same thing. Um, okay, it says the kingdom of God, you know, in Romans chapter 14, talks about the kingdom of God, but it's not called the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, no mention of the gospel of the kingdom. That's the gospel defined. He doesn't say the gospel of the kingdom. This is the gospel of the kingdom which I preached unto you and wherein you know, ye stand. So he doesn't say anything about it. What's going on? Why is that preached in the time of Jacob's trouble? It's preached in the time of Jacob's trouble because the king is returning at the end of the thing. Yeah. Compare Scripture with Scripture, brethren. Let's continue. Um... Verse 11, Mark 13, verse 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what ye shall speak, neither do ye premeditate, but uh, whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. All right? And that's, you know, that's, again, you'll have things dispensationally where it'll cross dispensational lines. This is true for somebody in the Old Testament. This is true for somebody today. It'll be true for somebody in the time of Jacob's trouble. Certainly. The Holy Spirit will speak through you. Absolutely. Verse 12. Now the brother shall betray the brother to death, and the father the son, and the children shall rise up against their parents, and shall cause them to be put to death. We see that today. Yeah. A lot of these little school programs and stuff, the little tattletale things, and mommy and daddy are, you know, is mommy taking too long of a bath or something? That is leading to global warming and things you should probably tell us. And does daddy have some firearms, you know? And, uh, you know, kind of maybe tell us about that and stuff like this. I mean, they've been doing that for years and years in the public schools, getting children to turn on their parents. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, it ratchets up to a whole new level. Hmm. Verse 13. And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Uh, work salvationists, this is one of the ones that they will use. Because it does prove work salvation. But see, they'll cross dispensational lines. They disobey the command in Scripture to rightly divide the word of truth. And they'll go back here and they'll use this. They'll use Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. And they'll say, see, we have to endure to the end to be saved. We have to die in a state of grace. <laughs> you know? It's so funny because so many of the heretics that are out there right now, they're actually going to be speaking truth in the time of Jacob's trouble. But if they don't have the character right now to get saved with as easy as it is to get saved, what makes you think that they're going to get saved in the time when they actually do have to work for their salvation? 
See, it isn't going to be self-righteousness in the time of Jacob's trouble. It isn't going to be going around saying, I, you know, re repent uh, daily of my sins and I, and I just, whenever I'm bad, I just, you know, I lose my salvation and I have to go back and I have to get it all over again and things like that. No, 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 no. <laughs> time of Jacob's trouble, you lose your salvation in that time because you take the mark of the beast in your right hand or in your forehead, you're done. You're finished. You don't get to repent again. That's what the verses in Hebrews are talking about. All right. So these people that, it, it's so funny, the ones that, that, that can lose their salvation, they lose it all the time and they get it back all the time. And then they'll try to quote verses from Hebrews that say if you lose it, it's done and you never get it back. Kind of weird how that works. But of course you have the eternal security Baptists and they'll come out and they'll say, this doesn't refer to salvation. In, at least in terms of eternal salvation. It, it, it's more of a temporal salvation. It's more of you're saving yourself from trouble and um, you know things that you don't have to endure to the end to be saved in the sense of heaven or hell. It's just you're saving your life. It's not what it's talking about. And the reason you know that is if you go back to Matthew chapter 24, Verse 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all na nations. And then shall the end come. Endure to the end. Then shall the end come. The gospel of the kingdom being preached is you have to endure to the end. Why? Because the king's coming back. You want to be part of that kingdom? Read Matthew chapter 25, the judgment of the nations. Hey, I'm not going to follow the Antichrist. Why? Because my King Jesus Christ is coming back. And he told me not to take the mark, so I'm not going to take the mark. Well, that's going to be rough for you. Well, I'm going to have to endure to the end to be saved. It all lines up. If you rightly divide the word of truth. If you say, everything in there is for me. The Gospels, the Old Testament, the Pauline Epistles, everything is for me. You're going to make a mess of the Scriptures. But let's continue. Verse 14. But when ye shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them which be that be in Judea flee to the mountains. I mean, again, it's them in Judea. Oh, no, these are Christians in America and England and, you know, and whatever. No, it's them in Judea. The time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, and again, you, you compare this with what goes on over in Matthew chapter 24, and again, you're seeing the same thing. When you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, here it says standing where, you know, uh, it ought not, he's in the temple, the rebuilt temple. Christians, our body is the temple of God. I'm not worried about the Antichrist standing in my body. And these guys, these, these Fruit Loop posties, they will do all sorts of gymnastics. And Well, you see, when it says standing where it ought not, it just means, and, you know, I know that our bodies are the temple of God, but it, see, it's, it's, it, they come up with these wild explanations and things like that. Or you could just read it and believe what it says, you know. There's an original thought. It's for the Jews. You know, and they'll, get, they'll do this thing too. You know, people say, well, you and your precious Jews and stuff like this, and you think the Jews are just so wonderful and things. The Jews are God's chosen people. Are they wonderful and holy and pure and sinless? Absolutely not. That's the reason for the time of Jacob's trouble. Some people don't get it. Verse 15, And let him that is on the housetop not go down into the house, neither enter therein to take anything out of the house, out of his house. And let him that is in the field not turn back again for to take up his garment. But woe to them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. And you say, but, you know, okay, I saw earlier talking about, you know, children too. Uh, you know, children shall rise up against their parents, shall cause them to be put to death. Verse 12. Well, now how's that possible if all the children are raptured first? Huh? Well, I would simply say, look at verse, you know, um, 17. Them that are with child, they become... With child, I don't like to use the word pregnant. That's not a Bible word. It's a modern abortion term. Um, you know, somebody that becomes with child in that time and to them that give suck in those days, so another very young baby. And this is happening at the, about the midpoint of the time of Jacob's trouble. So you got three and a half years. 
there between rapture and this time happening. So it's quite possible to have young children at that point in time. And, you know, as far as the thing of children rising up against their parents and causing them to be put to death, well, again, you know, you could have some, uh, you know, I consider young people in, you know, early teens, I would still consider them to be children, called, you know, causing their parents to be put to death. But, uh, again, you know, like I said, you know, I'm not going to, you know, go wild on the thing of the children leaving at the rapture. I don't know. I was asked that question a while back, and I've said my opinions on it. Um, but let's continue here. Verse 18. And pray that your flight be not in the winter. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of the creation which God created unto this time, neither shall be. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. Who are the elect that he has chosen? The Jews. Okay? And again, we can get into a whole big study on that thing. And God has to literally supernaturally shorten the days so that some of those Jews would be saved. Pretty incredible. You know, and it's funny too because you think to yourself, i got to just say this, it's like you think the world's just going to be kind of in good shape and then rapture and then the time of Jacob's trouble and everything goes falls to pieces after that it's and it's like more and more i'm going i think the world's actually going to be pretty much wrecked before the time even gets started <laughs> and it's going to get really bad you know the beginnings of sorrows that we're in right now i believe you know we have major earthquakes this was the worst year of hurricanes to ever hit america i mean the fires out in california the napa valley that just like wiped everything out i mean it's incredible time of jacob's trouble it's even going to be worse pretty amazing verse 21 and then if any man shall say to you lo here is christ or lo he is there believe him not for false christs and false prophets shall rise and shall show signs and wonders to seduce if it were possible even the elect but take ye heed behold i have foretold you all things so they're gonna to have to take heed to the words of jesus it's kind of funny because they rejected jesus so they go into the time of jacob's trouble and the only way that they get through it is to believe the words of jesus Lord has a sense of humor, okay? <laughs> but uh, again, we go back to the thing of the false Christ. A lot of these Christs. And uh, what religion is it that um, has more false Christs in it than any other religion out there? That would be uh, that one. Hmm. And uh, what's the world religion going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble? I firmly believe it's going to be Roman Catholicism. Radical pre-Vatican II Roman Catholicism. And, and I'm seeing it more and more. It's coming back. More and more Catholics are becoming more and more radicalized and starting to say that, you know, the Inquisition wasn't a bad thing. And what happened in the Dark Ages wasn't a bad thing. And Christians, you know, heretics that call themselves Christians, they should be killed. And we should wage war on Islam and all this other stuff. I'm telling you, the reemergence of radical Roman Catholicism. So, verse 24, but in those days after that tribulation, uh-oh, the big favorite thing, Matthew chapter 24, with the posties, they'll say, Matthew chapter 24, you know, verse 21 plainly says, you know, uh, for then shall be great trib no, not verse 20 29, excuse me, immediately after the tribulation. And they say, see, right there, it's after the tribulation is the rapture. <laughs> Look. Okay, where's the word rapture in that verse 29? It's not there. Okay, you know. Think. But you see, you compare it again. The tribulation is not a title for the time that's coming. It's the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week. That's determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Daniel chapter 9 talks about that. But you see, you compare Scripture with Scripture, and all of a sudden you have a problem. Immediately after the tribulation, see, they'll try to do that. But you compare it to Mark 13, after that tribulation. It doesn't say the tribulation. It's after that tribulation. Tribulation is the description of what happens. It's horrible events that happen in that time period. It's not a title. But you see, the posties have to cling on to that little title as just with a death grip. 
They have to call it the tribulation because if they call it the time of Jacob's trouble or Daniel's 70th week, then it takes the shift away from the church. You know? The church takes the focus away from them and puts it on Israel. And they don't want that. It has to be about the church. And certain Christians are not going to make it. And, and, and others of us that are strong in the faith and, and strong and prepared for this time will be the ones that make it through. We will be the ones that endure to the end. And, and, mm -hmm. It's incredible. Verse 24. Mark 13, verse 24. But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Okay? Compare that with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. In a moment in the twinkling of an eye. That's not a moment in the twinkling of an eye. You see all that stuff happening. It's not going to be a like that. The rapture is going to be just like that. Twinkling of an eye. Blink. Gone. You know, I might do a video at some point in time in, in the future on these, you know, stupid rapture videos and stuff that, you know, these guys have come out with and things that they, they show like the Left Behind series and whatever else. And, it, and it's like some kind of a people see clouds and it's gathering and all of a sudden and all this stuff is happening. That's not the rapture. The rapture is in a moment in the blink, in the twinkling of an eye. Boom. Gone. Here one second, gone the next. That's what the rapture is. This is not the rapture that we're reading about here in Mark 13. Okay, verse 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. All right, we're going to see about this when we get into the passages over there in Luke. What is this gathering thing about? Okay, they make it into a rapture. It's not a rapture. Right? I'm going to show you what it is in a little bit. Verse 28 in the next study I'm saying. Now learn a parable of the fig tree when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is near. So ye in like manner when ye shall see these things come to pass, know, know that it is nigh even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Unless you believe in the Mandela effect, then you know CERN magically changes your Bible somehow without, you know, with the ink can look just like it, you know, is aged or whatever else, and they can do this somehow magically through technology. It's stupid. The whole Mandela th effect thing. If you haven't seen our video on that, it was it was devised by a witch. Okay, <laughs> and I mean that she's a witch. All right, mind control programmer actually. If you want to get into it, but um, it's. You know, this prophecy here, verses 28 and 29, I believe, again, you compare Scripture with Scripture. The fig tree is a type of Israel. And so I have, I believe, and I've always taught, that when you see the rebirth of Israel as a nation, that it's because of the time of Jacob's trouble. We can't have, you know, the, this time show up if the Jews aren't back in their land and, you know, all the stuff that goes on there. And when that happens, when they become a nation again, then you have that generation is not going to pass till all things are fulfilled. You know, now does it mean those that were born in 1948 or those that were there in 1948? And, you know, you get into all that debate there. But the point is, we're in that time period. Things are stacking up very quickly. We are in the end times. There's no doubt about that. Now, verse 32 is an important verse. But of that day and that hour knoweth no man... No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. All right? Jesus is on the earth at that point in time. There are still things that are being offered to the Jews. Remember, after he dies on the cross and comes up from the dead and everything else and sends back up to heaven, they go to the Jews first. It's presented to them. All right? So there are still some things that are going on there. Jesus is here in time. God the Father is in heaven. All right? Just as our souls, we are seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now, if you're saved. Do you know everything that's going on in heaven right now? No, you don't. All right? We are in time. God is outside of time up in heaven. So it's not that Jesus Christ and God are somehow totally disconnected and they, 
and you know Jesus is not really God manifest in the flesh or something. No, that's not what's going on there. It's the Bible's still taking place here, and the Jews had a, had a had a chance to accept or reject him as their Messiah. All right. Again, I've talked about that in other studies, but let's continue here. Verse 33, Take ye heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. And again, the posties get all excited and they say, see, I say unto all, that means Gentiles and Jews and everything. Oh, or it could actually mean what I say unto you, my disciples, I say unto all the Jews to watch. Okay, that doesn't somehow give uh, some kind of a thing now where you can put the church in with that or something like that. Uh, no, the Jews are going to have to be watching towards the end of that thing. Again, they're preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's a different gospel than we have right now. All right. Jesus is not going to come back and set up a, a physical kingdom on the earth for Christians and will have good church services and stuff like that. It's about the nation of Israel. He doesn't come to some Christian special place and set up his kingdom. He sets it up in Jerusalem, the city of the great king. Okay, It's, it's about the Jews. It's about the nation of Israel. That's what's been promised to Jesus Christ. That's what he's going to have for the millennial kingdom. He will be ruling and reigning the world from Jerusalem. Okay? So, again, comparing Scripture with Scripture. You go through Mark 13. We're going to go through Luke 17 and Luke 21 on uh, the next two studies. And uh, you compare it with Matthew chapter 24. It's all the same stuff that's going on there. And then you compare it with what goes on in the Pauline epistles. It's not the same thing just not there all right so do not be deceived by the post trib these heretics that are out there trying to say that the church has to go into this time period for some kind of final purification and things like that I me mean, right there you know it's heresy because jesus christ his blood cleanses us from all sin as christians today we are washed by the blood of jesus christ his blood takes away our sin but the jews and the gentiles that are in the time of jacob's trouble According to Revelation chapter 7, they're washing their own robes. They have to endure to the end to be saved. There's an element of works in their salvation. They have to believe in Jesus, certainly. But they can't take the mark of the beast. And according to Revelation chapter 14 verse 12, they also have to keep the commandments. Faith of Jesus and the commandments. All right, that's going to be it for Luke or excuse me, Mark chapter 13. We're going to go on to Luke 17 next. So we will see you in the next study.